Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome back to Modern Leadership, the podcast where weekly we sit down with amazing authors, entrepreneurs, and leaders to deep dive into their journey, the highs, the lows, and the lessons learned. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Lewis Carter. Lou is CEO and president of the Best Practice Institute, a benchmark research consortium, association, and management consulting firm. He is the author of multiple books, including Change Champions and Best Practices in Talent Management. He has lectured at universities and institutions worldwide and has appeared in Fast Company, Investors Business Daily, Business Watch Magazine, and many more. His newest book is In Great Company, How to Achieve Peak Performance by Creating an Emotionally Connected Workplace. Lou, it's so great to have you with us. How are you today? Jake, I'm doing great. I really appreciate you having me on your show. Well, and we're going to jump into some very cool stuff here. But before we do, by way of background, who are you and how did you find out about us on this podcast? Well, I'm I'm Lou, as you mentioned. And I found out about your podcast. It, it just was great because I, I love the the leadership types. I took your quiz and I was really impressed. I became I was the problem solver, which was very cool. And I love how you connected it to different kinds of superheroes and movie stars and movies, which was really a neat thing to do. So I was I'm really psyched to be with you today and, and your different books that you've also authored and your point of view. You're just your your thinking. So I'm I'm glad that you're on today. Well, very cool. All right, let's start with this Best Practice Institute. Now, this is a consulting firm that you founded. You're the CEO of. Tell us what you do and the type of people that you work with. Yeah, so so, so BPI, I started back in 2001. And, uh, I started it really because I thought what was important to do was to create a community that thrived on people who really liked to be with each other. And I, when I was getting my graduate a degree at Columbia. My first day, I forgot to set my alarm. And somebody won, though, uh, that day. I, I was instead woken up by the, uh, it was 9-11, so the, the first plane hitting the tower. Something came out of that that day. And, and my my reaction to 9-11 in Columbia was to start a drum circle. So take that, Al-Qaeda. Yeah. So I started a drum circle, and the drum circle was all about bringing people together who were pretty much depressed and completely disconnected from the world. Everybody in New York City was like that and lost people. It's just this terrible feeling. And every, for the people who stayed, because most people left, you know, that we'll speak later about that in terms of who leaves your company, who stays, and what happens when they stay. People who stayed, we needed a way to really get together, listen without airs and putting on airs and talking to things that we don't want to talk about, especially in times when we're in our peaks and our valleys and our lows, when when we're in our lows. And drumming brought us all together. And I had written books and done consulting before, and I wanted to create a really connected community of people who got together and worked and lived and were together without airs. So I, that's what started a BPI, really. I didn't go directly to ask executives to become part of a drum circle. I asked them to be part of a consortium, a research benchmark consortium. And I said, I went to my friend at Pfizer and said, hey, we were joking around, could I have a job at Pfizer? And I knew right away I didn't want to do that. That wouldn't be any fun. So Joe said to me, no, Lou, you you know you don't want to do that. I said, okay, well, why don't we do something that'll be fun for us? He he says, "I, I know you, Lou. I said, hey, Joe, let's create a benchmark research consortium, and we'll do all the stuff we did together in the books, best practices and leadership development and org change and what we, in the book we put you in. And we'll bring other people together, and we'll talk about what we're doing really well to develop leaders, and we'll bring in all the, our mentors like Venice and Marshall Goldsmith and Richard Becker, all the people we really appreciate. He's like, man, that sounds great. He signed my first check. He told Volvo, and Volvo told Boston Scientific, he just started Bank of America came on all, we all became friends. And th- these are people, you know, it's in- interesting. We talk about companies versus people. These are people inside of companies who are chief town officers and chief human resources officers, C-levels, who get together. And I always say a, a company is, a, are pe- they're made up of people. So these are people who got together and worked together, shared, learned, networked, answered questions, got better together, 
held each other accountable for success. So tell me kind of how you had this structured, because I'm looking at the names of these companies and the people that you were able to gather together. And I'm thinking to myself, as an outsider, I would love to be on the inside of that circle. So tell me kind of how you structured this and how you kept control over all the different ways that everybody wanted to take this idea that you had. Structure and control probably didn't have a lot to do with it at first, which is interesting. It, It probably had more to do with an openness and a willingness to become part of something that felt larger than themselves. And it was to them and to me as well. And I always said to them, one very big thing is that this has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with what we're creating and how we're going to help each other. I was very specific to that. And later we had operations and finances, finances and processes. What was more important though, in the beginning was we made it simple. These are, these were just, I call them gentle people agreements. I agree that we have a certain fee and we paid it. We took part in it, meetings, and we have a portal and a structure and webinars and companies got involved. And it just was a very organic development. Later became much more structured, of course. And the people who became part of it first were just awesome people who were top of the industry, you know, Nathaniel Brandon, Kathleen Dannenmiller, Warren Bennis, Marshall Goldsmith. These are just phenomenal people who created the the foundational elements of BPI and sort of standing on the shoulders of, of these giants and working in their research and their excellence in practice and and in conjunction with people who are really doing the work on on the on the ground. And you talk about how businesses are really just a group of people. And when you talk about BPI, you're talking about attracting people from different companies to come and be a part of the experience that you're creating, this consortium, this research and consulting firm that you're working on. And the idea is that these people that made up these big companies were coming and being a part of this group. Why did they want to be a part of your group? What is it that drew them to you? And I'm kind of teeing you up here because Lou, I know that your personality and your style is such that it drives people to you. And so I wanted to tee up a little bit to talk about that, how people from inside other companies were drawn to you and your company. It's an interesting question. I wrote an article along with one of my founding members, his name is Patrick Carmichael. And we said, let's get together all the other people who are doing exactly what we're doing. And let's ask them the question of what do you do really well? And we'll also say what we do really well. And it became an article that was published by Training and Development Magazine called Best of Best Practices. And we showed how we differentiate ourselves from others who are doing the exact same thing. I call up all the owners of the companies and we ask a simple question, what makes you different in, in terms of what you do? So our differentiating factor from everybody else was the fact that we use organization development principles, which is basically planned interventions and designs to enable ourselves to achieve our goals. What does that mean? Well, the actual members, the companies, those with whom we serve inside of companies are the designers. So we end up giving the transfer, we transfer knowledge to the inside. So they become part of the design team. So imagine an organization development team inside of a company actually creating the agenda with us, co-creating it. Imagine the consortium co-creating the agenda with us facilitating it with us. So you might have heard of some of these technologies like open space technology sure. or Mar- yeah, or my voice boards, future search or whole system transformation. These are all really cool technologies that we've used inside of meetings and take part in both our consulting firm as well as in our consortium. The biggest differentiating factor of what we do is knowledge transfer and giving the power to people inside of companies to take what we do and replicate it so we can basically leave the system and enable them to be self-sufficient. And I want to take that and I want to move to this new book that you got that at the time that this podcast episode goes live, it'll be on bookshelves in great company, how to achieve peak performance by creating an emotionally connected workplace. And I want to start by defining what an emotionally connected workplace is. And then I want to look at these five essential elements to creating this emotional connection. So Tell us about this book. What is this emotionally connected workplace? And then we'll jump into the essential elements. So what's funny about um, 
<clears throat> emotional connection is that people think it's very fluffy, right? You have to be, you have to feel a connection, and you have to be empathetic, and and you have to be, uh, you have to have this kind of emotional regulation. Yes, wonderful. They're all great things. Emotional intelligence is extremely important for emotional connectedness. What makes emotional connectedness the next step further past EI, emotional intelligence, is that it digs into the real work, the real work in business. What does that mean? That means that we're going to talk about and discover ways that we really co-create and collaborate in real time. We're going to talk about ways that we align our values, that we choose to respect others and be respected. We're going, to, we're going to talk about the way in which we are able to look at a positive future, creation of a positive future, the vision for the future. And then finally, how we create killer outcomes together. So it, it's S-P-A-R-K, systemic collaboration, positive future, alignment of values, respect, and killer outcomes. Spark is what happens when you spark a relationship between and among individuals, funny story, how, did, how Spark came to being, I did a bunch of studies on it throughout the globe. I did four specific studies that proved that when you're effectively committed and you love your workplace, you're three to four times more likely to perform more and better at work. Pretty easy stuff to know, right? That's pretty simple. And basically, we found that when, you, when, when you're disenfranchised, yelled at in meetings, or uh, don't have a chance to innovate, and you're, uh, the basically uh, 2% of those people will leave the company. The other 98% of them will stay cash a paycheck and make your life a living hell. And this is so important. Let's make sure that our listeners caught this, right? We're talking about people who are not emotionally connected to your company. 2% are going to do what? They're going to leave. The other 98% are going to stay cash that paycheck. And make your life a living hell. So you have to watch out who pours your cup of coffee in the morning. Just be careful what you're sipping. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And that's why this is such an important factor that we're talking about here, this emotional connection with people in the workplace. Because people have options, but although they have options, those who are disengaged, those who are not connected, end up sticking around and being a thorn in your toe the entire time. And so let's walk through this idea of spark. Start, start with our S. Spark has everything to do with how you stay. So let's talk about that. So people stay inside of a company, not because of comp, benefits, salary, comp, any, anything that's related to typical things you see on Glassdoor, or even what Inc. Magazine calls the most important things for your employees is compensation. It's not true. Yeah, this objective idea that we can just you know put a label on it and say, look, we'll just pay them more and get them to stay. That'd be easy. But it's not that way, is it? It's not that way. Because in our study, again, nine out of 10, not two out of 10, which was about comp and salary, said they would perform more and better if they felt that spark. So why is it, what is about spark that makes it different for people. So I'll give you the what Spark is all about. So I brought a group of 20 executives together and I split them in half. I did, not that kind of splitting in half, I, although I'm sure you can think of a few executives you like to split in half. So I divided a few of them. So I split the two, I split them in two groups. One group I used the Spark statement with and I said, okay, and I put them into dyads and have them introduce each other with Spark. And the other one, group B, I left alone. So what has sparked with that? Those the group A? Well, basically, I said, okay, I want you to introduce each other like this. I want you to tell each other and take notes as you're going to introduce them. Tell each other how, what, what is the best way that you collaborate inside of an organization system to get stuff really done the right way so you really help yourself and others. And that's just that's one question. I bet you have an answer to that, right? I bet you do right there. You know, you'd be able to say that. What, what would you say? How do you collaborate the best systemically? How do you do it best, right? Yeah. How, how would you, right? Yeah, I, I mean, personally you- would do it. You know, when I'm looking at the way that I best collaborate, you know, I'm a, and I think back to my days in law school when I was working on negotiation. I'm not a negotiator where I try to hold the power. I'm a negotiator where I try to look for win-win. So for me, when it comes to collaboration, it's really about a win-win scenario and I'm willing to give up some of my ground in order for the two of us to come to a meeting of the minds. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that so you collaborate by enabling others to shine at times, and then they're and, and thereby helping making your life better as a result of having them in it, and their lives better as a result of you of having you in it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. 
that that so that would be number one. So <laughs> we'd be done with that. We go to number two, which is the P, which is positive future. Simple question: How do you create a positive future for yourself and others? So they'd say the same thing to you. How do you do it? Like you know, how would you how would you do that? We can go through this for an interview for you, yeah. and then I I'll I'll mirror it back. Well, and when it comes to positive future, I'm very like introspective. So I like to look and I'm analytical. My degree is in deductive logic and analytic thinking. So when it comes to a positive future, I'm very analytical of where the roads are going to split and what the trails are going to lead to. So when I look at positive future, I look at all the different possibilities and openings in the future for me. It's awesome. So you're able to look at a physical, we'd say you're a physical thinker. You see all the possibilities. You see all the, po- the, the logic behind it because you have this, you have an amazing analytical ability uh, that you both trained and sounds intrinsic. I would agree with that. Yeah. So we just came to, we just, we just came to a conclusion on that. Now we'll go to the third one. Ready? Okay. <laughs> so it's alignment of values. So this is it. So what are your strong values and how do you align them with others? Well, a strong value for me is being open, authentic, and honest. It's really connecting not just what you want to hear, but really, truly how I feel internally. Awesome. So aligning your values and your values are really about an inner feeling, a, a feeling of what, what, something that feels right to you. Yes. Yep. I got it. That's, that's very cool. So that's how I'd introduce you for alignment of values. Let's go to R. Respect. How, how do others respect you and how do you respect others? You know, this is an interesting question for me. And I'm taking this on the fly as I do this, what's popping into my mind is I look at kind of titles and opportunity. Like the way that somebody respects me is by giving me more and more flexibility, more and more freedom, or more and more opportunity to implement my ideas. And I'm thinking now I'm the leader of a company, but I'm working with a group of other leaders and I'm saying, what's one way that people could show respect for me or how I feel respected is somewhat by being given the authority or the responsibility to take uh, action. That's awesome. So you feel when you're empowered, you feel respected. Yes. Awesome. We just did that. So I would write that down, right? And the the last one is killer achievement and killer outcome. So this is the killer, the the K. So (laughs) how do you create the best outcomes for yourselves and others inside of your company? You know, at the end of the day, I want to feel proud of what we accomplished. I want to look back and see that we moved the needle, that we didn't just push paper from one side of the desk to the other, but that our activity resulted in achievement. Awesome. See that, that, so this is terrific. So you're, and, and that's the way that you, you create a sort of uh, a, a, the fact that everybody knows that they've achieved is that way you create killer outcomes. That's not for, so for me too, I feel, I'll just go through quick, you know, I collaborate by enabling others to, uh, to mirror, support, uh, challenge, and move to decisions. That's me. For a positive future, I always give a vision. So you mentioned that in your, in your problem-solving qu- uh, questionnaire, your question about what kind of leader we have. That's one of them. About, I, give a vi- I like giving a vision that, that enable for, so that people know where we're going, especially when there's a lot of resistance. And then I align my own values and that of others by being open about how I like to work and giving feed forward to enable people to have advice and how to get better working with me. I respect others always first so that we can create boundaries with how we can move together into the future and understand what people need and in order to get better and to make both of our lives better. And I also expect the same from people and also killer achievement and outcomes. I work day in and day out to ensure that, that nothing falls through the cracks and the team is very well oiled and well aligned and that we all are on literally the same page, not just for writing. Also, we are in our technology stack. We know where, what we've done. We check everything off. We know what we've achieved for the day. That's my spark. So we, you and I just did a spark uh, and it's all throughout the book. You can read how Hubert Jolie's spark uh, over at Best Buy and how he visioned and what he's done to vision at Best Buy. You can read all about Howard Bahar's spark at Starbucks, what he did at Starbucks. I'm literally looking through my book right now. You could open this up and see this here. You can look through Big River Steel's spark. You can look through WD-40's spark. All kinds of leaders, you know, generals of the U.S. Army, 
brigadier general, a uh, phenomenal guy uh, who, who learned about how he sparked and created respect among uh, Korean augmentee soldiers and U.S. soldiers and how there was some discrepancy there. And it's, so, and what he did to create more of a, of a spark between them so that they basically didn't die in battle. Yeah, a very positive thing to do when you are looking at a general in the army. So I want to ask you specifically about one of the letters in this spark. I want to ask you about respect. Because I know you talk an awful lot about this, and even when you, we were going through this activity, this process, we talked about this R for respect. And I want to ask you why the number one concern in the workplace should be respect in your eyes. Awesome question, because like we put in the book, it's, the, it's what ignites the spark. It's what all the other SBARK, and it ignites them because it was interesting what we found. People said this. They said, I expect to be respected, and yet... I know that respect is earned. So there's a discrepancy in that. So in every workforce, we all think you have to earn my respect, yet we all expect to be respected. So there's this, di- there's this kind of dichotomy. They're not quite intersecting. The math doesn't work there. This is very fascinating. This is a light bulb popped on here because I feel exactly like what you just said. I demand respect. I want people to respect me. But I also believe that respect is something that's earned. So when I look at other people, I say to them, I will give you respect when you earn it. But when it comes to me personally, I just expect those that follow me and those that I associate with to automatically show respect towards me. And there's a dichotomy there. There's a little bit of a difference between what we expect from others and what we expect for ourselves. You said it very, very well. It, 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 what we must do then is change the respect equation. That other group I was talking about yeah. before in that room. The control group, if you were doing a scientific experiment. <laughs> exactly. The control group, to be exact. You, you know what happened? The 2 and 98% rule started there. 2% of left in the other ones, they were upset. They were angry. They were frustrated. So we're paranoid. And in all truth, I was taping them. <laughs> so that's what happens in that environment. So respect is earned and we're changing the equation because we all have to earn it. And we all have to realize that we're on the same page all at once, earning respect from each other. And you think of it like a systems thinking diagram. There's an R and there's another R. And the R, when you exercise that one R, another, and you have kind of a arrow to the other R uh-huh. that, that goes, goes up and then another arrow to that other R. It is a virtuous circle, and you have a graph to the right of behavior over time. Guess what happens? It's not a negative hockey stick. It's a positive hockey stick. That thing is up all the way. It doesn't stop. And what it represents is that as respect is given, respect is earned. And as respect is earned, respect is given. And it just keeps building on itself up and to the right. It's that beautiful. And it's that real. And when you veer from it, it, you can see it go down. You see, it just go down and that you state a simple principles. Is my life better as a result of having you in it? What are we doing for and with each other to help ourselves and the world and the company to be better? And if we all live like that, life is better. Yeah, beautifully said. And I appreciate this conversation. And I'm looking at the clock and I'm going, where in the world did our time go? It's clicked on very quickly. And it's time now for us to move to the final section of the podcast where we ask you some personal questions to go along with this business conversation. It's called Learning from Leaders. Lou, are you ready? I am ready. All right. Question number one, then. The book currently on your Kindle or bedside table, what are you reading? I spent two years writing this book, okay? Yeah. (laughs) In great company. So sometimes when you write a book, you don't always read it. Okay. Yeah. So th- now this is not this is just self promoting. I'm holding it right now because I am actually reading and rereading this book because I spent so much time in the weeds in this book, and there's so much inside of it that I just want to take in and absorb it. So I am re- officially reading in great company. You know, I love that you gave this as your response because I'm thinking to myself, earlier this week, I sat down and listened to one of the episodes of my podcast. Now, I'm on the podcast. I did the interview. I did the editing. I understand what's on that podcast. But it was interesting to sit back and listen to the final product as it all came together. And there's some magic involved, not just in what is being said, not just in how it's being said, but also in how the editing and everything comes together to create a whole product. 
lovely. It was was wonderfully said. I I feel the same way. So much goes into a book, into a podcast. I know that. So much energy. And it's so good to just kind of sit back and and read it. And celebrate it. Celebrate it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with celebrating (laughs) your, your work. There's nothing wrong with it. It's actually a good thing. All right. Our second question, and we've already got a sneak peek, a problem solving leader. So your leadership superpower is problem solving, which is for the listeners and for the guests on this podcast is a very unique superpower. So I want to ask you about that superpower and kind of what you discovered during the process. Yeah. So, so I, the more I was reading about it, the more, what I got excited by was the fact that there were some pretty cool cats in it. So I, I couldn't say I'm like Jason Bourne. See, he, he's, he's a little too, too cool for me. But, How about MacGyver? Um, MacGyver would be the, the, the perfect one. But the, the people I, I, I really felt a kinship war with were the people who get their hands dirty, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and, you know, it, and, you know f- working through problems, seeing what the possibilities are, and, you know, and working through chaos as well. And I think that was a really beautiful part of your assessment, which was, you know, I saw there was more, you know, there's sort of more the logical analytical. There were the people who were a little more ra- random, chaotic, worked through things and got it done. There were people who really, you know, enabled a, an organizational process-driven structure, and it, it kind of allowed you to see, well, there are different team players in this, and this is how you fit in. It's how I fit in as well, and I do have that more. I checked off Steve Jobs because, you know, of course, he's one of the greatest entrepreneurs of all time. Absolutely. Oh, he's absolutely phenomenal, and I love that you had him in there. It, what I love about Steve Jobs and about the archetype that you put in there was that Steve was all about being honest. He and if somebody wasn't honest with him, probably fire them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so and you put that as one of your questions which was it was it was around kind of uh, you know who would you pick in your team what would you be disappointed at somebody on your team if they did something. And for me if somebody was dishonest or they didn't really give you an idea of what was going on in their minds or if they you know for you know basically like were uh, for lack of a better word, not not as professional as they should be. It's time to go. Yeah, I think about you know, Guy Kawasaki and you know how he he was working for Steve Jobs, uh, and um, Steve Jobs came over to him with the uh, was it with the CEO of Nowhere, and you know I don't know if you know them. <laughs> they said, and uh, so he, he he didn't tell Guy who the who it was he was with. He said, Hey, Guy, what do you think of this company? And so guys was thinking to himself, well, he could BS it and say something really nice yeah. or, right. Or a guy could be honest. And he knew that if he wasn't honest, Steve would probably fire him. So read said, right through it. Yeah. <laughs> he read right through it. So he's like, Hey, look, nowhere sucks. It doesn't have great technology stack. They, they don't really, uh, they can't, we can't use any Apple products through it. It's basically terrible and they should go bankrupt, something like that. So, so Steve says, thanks. Here's the CEO of nowhere. Oh, right. Shake his hand. Wow. <laughs> so, so Kai, you know, Guy felt great, though, because first of all, if he wasn't honest to Steve, because Steve demanded excellence at all times, he would have been fired or he later on would have known about it. Yeah. And he just dem- he demanded excellence and people may not have liked him for it. They may not have felt, quote unquote, what they typically think is emotional connectedness, which is emotional connection is not about that, by the way. You can be, quote unquote, mean, whatever that means. Steve wasn't mean. He was honest and he was a high achiever. And he was direct. He was direct. Yeah. He said it like it was. Beautifully. Yeah. That's exactly right. He didn't suffer fools and he didn't allow mediocrity. Boom. Boom. And there's so many great leaders like that. I mean, in, in the book too, that Bezos is like that. I mean, and we, we, we say so many bad things about Musk. We say so many bad things about leaders. What are we doing? Listen to them. They're, they're great leaders because they do not suffer fools and they don't accept mediocrity. It was so well said. Yes. Wonderful. Well, our next question then is a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra, or something that you live by. Let it go. Life is good. <laughs> you know, those are the Marshall Goldsmith is my number one mentor. He has influenced my life greatly, and since I started my career, and he, I'm part of his his MG100 group of coaches, and he he really has taught me about the value of shaking off things and letting it go and moving to the next and thinking forward, giving advice and realizing that we are in abundance and life is good. And I'm a huge believer in this idea of abundance. There is so much opportunity. It's ours for the taking. We just need to act 
And so I love that philosophy, that life mantra that you live by. Our final question in this section is the book that you most often gift to friends, family, or colleagues. I give away uh, what got you here won't get you there. That's the one because it, it really is. It's a great book about, again, letting go of the past. You know, one other mantra of mine that I, I more of what I made up is uh, let go of the things you think you know, and the greatest good will come to you. And that's that's what that book's about. And that it's also in great company we put in there about what got you here will not get you there. You're letting go of that that former self of things that no longer serve you well. You have to just cut it out of your life and then move forward because you're just not going to make it to the next level otherwise. Yeah, and this is such a great concept for our leaders to take to heart because oftentimes the tendency as you work and strive and build up your success to a certain level and it starts to plateau, the tendency is to kind of put it on cruise control and coast a little bit. But what got you to that point is not going to take you to the next level. And if you're not moving forward, you're going to be sliding backwards. So this is such a great book and a great idea that you shared. Now, Lou, alas, our time is to the end, but thank you for coming on and being a guest on this week's podcast. How can we find out more about you and connect? You know, the best way to find me is lewiscarter.com or bestpracticeinstitute.org. Go online, check out the book In Great Company on Amazon under Lewis Carter. Yeah, go to your bar- local Barnes and Nobles. Uh, it's all there. And yeah, we'll see you online or you can email me or however you'd like it online. Yeah, that'd be perfect. And we'll link it all up on the show notes. So they'll have one place to go and be able to get all this goodness that we talked about. Lou, you have such a tremendous background, a spark of enjoyment. And thank you for sharing your problem solving leadership talents with us. Thank you for being this week's modern leadership guest expert. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jay. All right, my friends, what a fascinating conversation about the spark of emotional connection within our workplaces and really identifying what makes people tick, identifying this synergistic collaboration that will help take our teams to the next level. As a modern leadership podcast, as a podcast that talks about leadership and some of the skills that we need to develop in the modern day. For leadership today, it's all about this connection with people. Because as Lou talked about, if you're not connected or if somebody's not connected to your organization, what's going to happen? Well, 98% of them are just going to stick around, cash a paycheck and give you half effort. Only 2% are going to take the authentic path of leaving. And so it's really important that we focus on sparking this emotional connection within our companies. What a fascinating conversation. Of course, Everything that we talked about on this episode of the podcast can be found at jakeacarlson.com slash ml126. 126 is the episode number. And until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days, an even better life. And remember, everything is figure outable. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there.